Hey everyone, just a heads up for anyone listening with young children, this episode comes with a warning, there will be a lot of talk about drug use. So keep that in mind as we move forward and enjoy. Additionally, we just wanted to give you all a heads up that in the next couple weeks when we do our Steve Jobs series, we are going to be running a couple of Amazon gift card contests. So make sure that you tune in and look out for those. Thank you. Hey everybody. Before we get into the show today, Melvin and I would just like to tell you how you can support the show. Don't forget to leave us a five-star rating in iTunes, write a written review, and tell a friend. You can follow us on social media. We're The Life of X on Facebook and Instagram and at Life of X Podcast on Twitter. We're definitely the most active on Twitter, so you should join us. Follow us there. Retweet our tweets. And head over to our support page at lifeofxpodcast.com. There you are going to find several options to support the podcast. The first is audible.com. For those of you who don't know what audible.com is, it is the largest purveyor of audiobooks on the internet. I have personally been using it for years. Many of the books that we have used for the podcast can be found on Audible. If you go through our portal on our page, you will receive a free audiobook when you sign up for a monthly subscription, and they will also kick us a few dollars. You can also support us by going through our portal to Amazon. If you do that, any purchases that you make, we'll get a small kickback. We've also added a featured book page to the website. Any of you who are interested in actually purchasing the books that we've used, many of which are fantastic books, you can go through there and that will route you through our Amazon portal to the Amazon page where you can purchase the books. And so, again, we get a few cents off each purchase. Additionally, we've set up a Patreon page. And for those of you who are unaware of what that is, it is a service wherein patrons can pledge a certain amount of money per episode. So every time Melvin and I release an episode, you would send us a dollar, two dollars, whatever you can. We would appreciate anything. We have goals set up. We have different tiers so that we can also reciprocate your generosity. All your dollars help. That's right. But again, we would just like to say that the most important thing that you can do is rate, review, and tell a friend. Help get our name out there. All right. Enjoy the show. Thanks, guys. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Eric Chidala. And I'm Melvin Barnes. And that makes this the life of X. Today, we have Marvin Pence Gay Jr. Mm. Mm. The man, the myth, the legend. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I did not realize how messed up his life was before we started looking into this. Yeah, kind of sad. Real sad. We're going to talk a lot about his life, and there's a lot of glitz and glamour, but there's also just like every turn. Every time there was something <laughs> good, he, he usually went out of his way to make his own life more difficult, it seems like. You know what they say? What do they say? The brightest stars, you know, they, they burn bright. But <laughs> they burn out the fastest. <laughs> they don't last too long. No, they don't. All right, so let's get into it. Marvin Gaye was born Marvin Pence Gaye Jr. on April 2nd, 1939, to his father, Marvin Gaye Sr., and Alberta Gaye in Washington, D.C. Marvin was the second eldest of Marvin Sr. and Alberta's four children. He also had two half-brothers that he was not especially close with. You know, one thing that is going to, it seems to be a recurring theme, is uh, terrible fathers. And, uh, well, you know, we're definitely going to get deeper into that with Marvin, but I just, if you've listened to our episode on, on Dwight Eisenhower, you'll remember that Dwight's father was a dud, and uh, we're, we're stepping that up a bit with Marvin, and uh, where his father is like a psychopathic murderer. I, I, I'm going to say this. I never thought that we would probably get a, a bad dad that would top Ike's dad, but we've, I think we've, but man, we've found the one. We are outdoing ourselves. Definitely um, not by design. No. And Marvin inherits a lot of his bad traits, it seems, from his father, even though he goes out of his way throughout his life to try to not be his dad. He sort of becomes his dad in, in a few ways. Now, I hate to say this again. You know what they say. We're all doomed to become our parents. Yeah. But that being said, he, one, and I know you're going to take off and talk about this now, but the, the one aspect of his father that it seems to have been a positive influence on him was their religion. 
Yeah, so uh, the gay family's religion was what we have uh, learned Complex. was a, a mix of, of Pentecostalism and Judaism. Uh, and for, for, as Arif says, the heathens out there that don't know, Pentecostals believe that uh, through baptism they can acquire the ability to kind of, how, how would we describe this? Have superpowers. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you describe okay, it. Okay, so first, you, they, can, they can speak in tongues, and then also they can receive divine messages. Um, from... Have you ever been around someone who's, who was speaking in tongues? Well, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm the son of a pastor. So I'll tell you what, fine. the first time I was around it, it was uncomfortable. I didn't know what was <laughs> happening. I had no idea what was going on. Well, look, I mean, anytime you're, you're, you're communicating with the divine, it's, it's, it's going to make some people uncomfortable. <laughs> it sure did. Well, yeah, back to... Uh, to Marvin um, and their family's religion. Marvin Sr. was actually a fairly, a person of status within the, the church that they attended, which was the Church of the Living God. Uh, uh, well. It, or it the was, House of God. It was the House of God, the Holy Church of the Living God, the Pillar and Ground of Truth, the House of Prayer for All People. This reminds me of a lot of like, you know, the African-American church where you have like these long names. Where think, it's like the fifth all, house of the Holy Tabernacle of the... Aren't these up? like passages from the Bible? Is what it, that's what it seems like to me anyway. They're like bits and pieces of passages from the Bible. My father would be upset with me, but I, I really, I can't. Heathen. Uh, heathen. <laughs> Melvin. Also, I, I can't say with certainty. Side note, for all of you listeners who have no reason to know this, I call Melvin Marvin all the time because it bugs him. And so I'm sure that throughout this podcast, I will probably be doing the same unintentionally. But it's just, it's just going to happen. We're going to have to live with it. Back to the religion. I think you touched on it, but I think it's important to to point out that this wasn't just normal Pentecostalism. No, they were was... they were extreme in their prayer and in their other traditions. Yeah, they were they were definitely way out there. Because they also they it was a combination. It was Pentecostalism and Judaism. Yeah, so I mean they observed uh the Sabbath, Sabbath on, on the Saturday. Saturday. There was also like no if you were if you were singing and praising oh, yeah. it had to be about it had to be about God. Yeah, you couldn't. There was no like secular singing. If you're gonna use that voice that was anointed by God, it was gonna be to the service of the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, and you also weren't allowed to observe Christmas and Easter. Yeah, so this was um, you know, this was they're, they're Pentecostals, but this was a very different um sort of Pentecostalism. So yeah, I mean that that's their religion, and this this would really kind of you know play an important role in their lives, and this is where Marvin really this is where it begins. Gets the music. Yeah, where he begins to to discover his his kind of his musical legs. Yeah, because of the religion, they were sort of seen, and we didn't mention this before, but they lived in the projects in D.C., and so you know they were around people of the same socioeconomic status, but no one else in the neighborhood had ever heard of this sort of religion or anything like it. So. Right, and let's take a moment to, to also point out that we're talking about D.C. in the 1930s, 1940s, and even into the 1950s. Uh, so it's still heavily segregated. A segregated city. Yeah. So yeah, you know the the African Americans, a lot of them are living in these urban projects. And as we usually do, completely forgot to mention the book that we base this ah, off of. Yes. But you should all be reading the blog posts as well, so it shouldn't really be an issue. But it's uh, David Ritt's biography of Marvin Gaye. Pick it up, and it's really good. But he points out in the book that it's not a traditional you know housing project that you might think of that they lived in initially, it was sort of almost rural. When I was reading the description, I read it a few times, and it was still hard, like, hard for me to wrap my mind around. They were still clustered together mm -hmm. in like, as, as you would think of in a project, but it was kind of... Outside of the city, maybe? I, there just wasn't a lot. Like, I guess outside of the project, there just wasn't a lot around of other stuff. So it seemed rural. Yeah. Well, I mean... I don't know, hard to... Sense. But it was like really, really... Hard to wrap your head around. Hard to wrap your head around, but also just like really bad living conditions. Like, Especially given D.C. today, though. Yeah. So they were a complete like anomaly to the people around them. And it was exacerbated by the way that uh, Marvin's father acted. Melvin had mentioned he was kind of a, a big deal. Eccentric man. Well, he was kind of a big deal in the church. And so he was also extremely arrogant. I mean, yeah. well, on a, on a cosmic scale. When you get those heavenly blessings raining down on you, you know, how, how do these mere mortals, uh, yeah. So he believed that he could speak in tongues at the drop of a hat and also heal people, which I, Ritz doesn't say that there was any reason for him to believe that he was, that he had ever actually healed anyone, but he 
<laughs> he just believed that he, he could thoroughly heal believed that he was he was healing. But he was he was very eccentric, and he believed from a young age that he was, you know, touched by God to to do great things. Yeah. And and so that gave him, you know, this really, he always had his nose up in the air when it came to people from the neighborhood. I guess he would scoff at the other Christians in the neighborhood who were like going to worship on Sunday and that sort of stuff. Like they're so dumb. They don't realize that the Sabbath was yesterday. They don't know what's up. Yeah, they don't know. But he was uh, really eccentric and really effeminate, which was a big deal for Marvin growing up. Yeah. So, I mean, let's, let's talk about some of the things that his father would would do. He he tended to from time to time dress uh, in women's clothing. Yeah, he would relatively openly, which is kind of surprising for the time. Yeah. Walk around the neighborhood in in his wife's clothes or if even when he wore traditional men's clothes, they always had something that a little twist, a little Yeah, flare. like something a little like lacy or stuff like that. And it really bothered Marvin, Marvin yeah. a lot because I mean, as kids do, they tease you, tease you hard. And Marvin really struggled with a lot of that from the kids in the neighborhood. And a lot of his hardships stemmed from his relationship with his father in general. And so we're going to run down some of those real quick. And, and since we're pretty much on the topic already, his father as his main masculine figure in his life from an early age really kind of skewed the way and affected the way anyway that the Marvin thought of masculinity. He had a lot of trouble. So for instance, when his, when these kids would make fun of him for his father or make fun of his father, Marvin's initial reaction was to want to fight. He would, you know, there's a quote from Ritz's book about how, how bad he, he wanted to get up and just smash their faces and kill them and, and also like that. But he was, you know, he, he, in his own mind anyway, he was a coward because he never did. And he, he always felt ran. He, wasn't, he felt like he lacked that manly, masculine yeah. Uh, quality. Yeah. So he, he ran away from a lot of these. Which in turn, you reinforced. know. Reinforced. Well, reinforced his idea that I'm not masculine or manly in the traditional sense. And also he just felt a ton of shame around the fact that, you know, in his mind, he was a coward. Yeah. Uh, you know, his neighborhood friends would fight over that sort of thing. And he always ran. Again, we've already, we touched on the cross-dressing, which is actually something that that Marvin picked up from yeah. his father. I mean, it's interesting to think, you know, you grow up and you see your dad, you know, he's either wearing women's clothing or his, I mean, his hair's done. I mean, you know, dad comes home with that, that clean perm. Um, and Marvin, clean, the cleanest of perms. <laughs> Marvin picked up some of that, you know, and that was something that, you know, from what we read, he struggled with um, in that he, he really liked to kind of dress up as in, in women's clothes from time to time, but he felt a, an immense amount of guilt about it. Again, and well, this is going to be a recurring theme that you'll see as you, or hear as you listen through this, but Marvin would always indulge in, he seemed unable to ward off any indulgence that he wanted to have. So if he wanted to dress in women's clothing, he did it. But then afterwards, he would feel tremendous shame. And it led to a lot of the depression that he had. But, but just to get back real quick to the, the cross-dressing, what was really interesting to me about Marvin picking this up from his father was that he so hated his father. And it just seems strange to me that, that he would do something that his father took so much pleasure in and doing. But yeah, I mean, Marvin never did it in public. As far as the, the length that he took, it was at uh, some of his shows later in his career, he would wear, I guess, what you could consider effeminate clothing. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I looked up some of the stuff and it just looked normal from that period Well, I think time. that we... I mean, we have, you know, from where we're sitting, it's a we're very enlightened. different. <laughs> it's a, we're all woke out here, but it's a very different thing. I mean, you know, like we've had this tradition of certain performers come down that we can look to, you know, like Prince. Yeah. And we say like, oh, okay, what he's wearing to us is, it's not all that out of the ordinary. Yeah. But, you know, given the, the time, um, some of these things, some of these things would have, would have stood out. But I guess at shows before he went on, he would always wear kimonos. And uh, like really, what? yeah, like really like silky kimonos and, and that sort of stuff. So I, I guess Yo, I don't that's the, the coolest thing I've heard all day. I know. I, again, I, whatever. I Except, that just strikes what? me as eccentric, but Ritz kind of points that out as like a, as a feminine thing. But like, who is he importing these like Japanese kimonos? From? <laughs> he was a different dude. Okay. So we've been talking about. Marvin's father and his relationship with his father, except that we've left out probably the most impactful part of it with Marvin, and that's how abusive that he was. Yeah, Marvin's father was um, a terrible man, incredibly violent. He would 
often beat Marvin. And Marvin said that he believed that there was no inch of his body that hadn't been bruised um, in some way, shape, or form by his father. Uh, and and he a lot of drive this... a lot of pleasure out of it too. Yeah, he... and and yeah, I feel like if you're not a lunatic and a violent person, I guess there's generally some remorse. Maybe mm-hmm. I don't know. I've never beat the crap out of a child before, but I imagine normal people, if they did that, they would feel bad. But he really seemed to take a lot of some pleasure sort of in it. Sick pleasure. And the weird yeah. thing is, is that Marvin and and here I'm referring to Marvin Jr. Uh, Marvin Gaye, the the musician, he seem to also be drawn to it at times in a, in a strange sort of way. I mean, he he so he so desired um attention and and affection. He just almost like he just wanted to be like touched, you yeah. know, what I mean, from his father. Yeah, so sometimes he would, you know, he would say that he he intentionally, you know, kind of antagonized his father to kind of draw on that uh that violence and the weird thing is that was so bad was that Marvin said, you know, it wouldn't even have been nearly as bad if it was just a case of his father, you know, beating him. But his father would kind of draw it out in these strange psychological bouts where he would kind of like send Marvin to his room in preparation for the beating and would like rattle the belt. belt he would he would uh, tell Marvin to go upstairs and strip so he'd be like completely naked. And yeah. then he would just for like an hour walk back and forth like rattling the belt. Yeah, like just sick stuff. Sick, weird dude. Um, and you know, a lot of this stemmed from a sort of jealousy that uh, Marvin Senior had um, with regards to his son, because you know when you know he was a he was a an important figure in their church, and when they would travel, sometimes he would take Marvin Junior with him, and he would perform, and all of these people, of course, would lavish this praise onto Marvin Junior because he's got this this angelic voice. Yeah, and his father would be upset at the fact that people would lavish, they would just apply more praise to kind of his son's performance than his own sermons. And I think this really comes to a head in, in the fact that, you know, his father ends up being passed up or this uh, sort of leadership position within the church. Yeah, and so he, he kind of breaks off from the church at first, but then eventually just becomes completely disconnected. And it's also important for us to note that all of the positions that his father held in the church, which, you know, were of some status these were unpaid positions like on top of this his father was economically worthless <laughs> can yeah. we i think we also need to, to take a moment and acknowledge again kind of like dwight's mom how great she alberta gay was She's a that rock saint because she worked as a domestic in the dc area to like wealthy families in dc and and uh, maryland and she was up at God knows what hour. 3 a.m. to catch the bus and throughout Marvin's entire life supported their entire household. Well, I shouldn't say his entire life because we'll get into it. He got he got his money and he supported them for a while, too. But at least through his entire or his childhood and early adulthood, she supported that entire family. Yeah. And one other thing about uh, Marvin that's this is this is kind of moving on to junior junior onto another thing is that, you know, despite all of this, he maintained this sort of rebellious. Uh, and street. gigantic ego giant ego yes and as i mentioned before you know he's going out and he's performing as a young man and people are like my god this guy's great and he was a good looking guy too yeah as he started to get older he's he was really shy around women at when he was younger but i mean he he still turned into a yeah i mean he still saw he's still I mean, Marvin people, he realized that women found him attractive right and I mean, his head got huge even from a very young age you know he knew he was a fantastic singer a good looking guy uh, so he was very arrogant and very rebellious as a as a young man. Yeah, and he really bucked authority throughout uh, his childhood. And in school, he he really didn't get along well with his teachers and any of the authority figures. And a lot of that stemmed from the fact that he was also relatively you know socially conscious of the fact that as an African American in the United States, he was second class citizen at best. And there's a passage in Ritt's book where he talks about a field trip that Marvin and his classmates took to all these monuments. And it was like, neat. These are just a bunch of rich white guys that, you know, like they don't mean anything to me. They, yeah, I live in an oppressed society. And so he really, really bucked authority, which makes his decision to join, leave, leave high school a I think, year early. I, yeah. 11th I think grade. 11th grade and join the air force really perplexing because I don't, well, I actually do know what he was thinking because he talks about it in Ritz book. And it just, it's funny to me that he had this 
distorted view of reality. So he he had talked to an Air Force recruiter at some point. And again, this kind of goes back to his, his inflated sense of self and also his issues with masculinity. He viewed the idea of being a pilot as like a hyper-masculine thing. Now, this is before... Uh, what's what's the famous movie like? Uh, Top oh, Gun. Top Gun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so he he viewed this as like a hyper masculine deal. He's gonna go and be this heroic pilot, and I don't know if he thought that, that was gonna be initially what happened. Like as soon as we get there, you go through boot camp and they throw Marvin you into the hero. A, yeah, they throw you into a plane, and mm-hmm. then you go. I don't know. Shoot down some 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 Russians. I, yeah, some Ruskies. Take them down. <laughs> Shot down two MiGs yesterday. Right. Uh, so needless to say, that was completely not what happened. He did join the Air Force, but he went through boot camp and all that stuff and then was stationed in these desolate areas in his mind doing tasks that were beneath him again yeah. in his mind. And so he bucked authority over and over again. And eventually he was like, I have to leave. I can't. I well, can't he, be here. He, he faked he, he, like he pretended went insane, right? Yeah, he pretended that he was insane. He just completely stopped bathing and like would babble when people would talk to him. And so he actually was medically discharged. Can you imagine like the Air Force guys like, man, we got to get this guy out of here. Can you imagine how happy they were when he left? <laughs> they were like, well, you know, we don't have any great music anymore, but he's, uh, he was great. But again, I, to understand how you go from like, I, I really hate Uncle Sam. I hate the United States. Let I'm me flying go fight planes for, them. <laughs> for Uncle Sam. Right. Uh, and he, he had like a fear of heights. And- yeah, he did. He was terrified of heights and also flying in general. Uh, we'll see later when he starts touring and stuff like that. He would always tour on buses because he just hated to fly. Yeah, this is... Uh, He's this, a different some, guy. some bizarre stuff going on here. Yeah, but like that's, that's just recurring theme throughout his entire life. And we didn't mention, but before Marvin left, his father had always kind of predicted that Marvin would be this great lawyer. And I just feel like irrationality runs in the family. <laughs> right. And, that, and this is, to some extent, his father projecting this onto Marvin, because I, I think he thought himself, like he himself would have been this fabulous Despite lawyer. Despite having like no education. Yeah, both of them were not great at school. Marvin was awful at school. And I'm not even sure, I, I would have to look back in the book, but I don't even think his dad finished a high school education. Yeah, it wouldn't have been that out of the ordinary i don't think i know but just to be like oh i'd have been a great lawyer yeah strange but so when marvin joins the air force his father's like yo what are you doing like i, I told you hey bro I, I told you <laughs> you were gonna be this great lawyer. So why are you going to the air force and from there his father just was like you're you're gonna be a bum you're going to come back here as a bum and just live on the streets and man was he ever right yeah, so so when <laughs> when Marvin does come back, I mean he's kind of he's he slinks back into town, right? I mean, wait, just real quick, Marvin Senior was right about Marvin Junior being a bum like four times over in his life. Maybe he was a prophet. I don't think there's any evidence that he ever healed anybody, but he might have been a clairvoyant. <laughs> well, Marvin slinks back into town and he actually he's like surfing from like between he friends. He was couch surfing yeah. before it was cool. Right. Well, he probably made it cool. Mm. Uh, so he is, he is living a sort of, not, not to disparage anyone who's out there. Not to surfing. disparage any bums. But. Yeah, it's, it's, perfectly, it's perfectly fine. But he, he wasn't working, right? He sure wasn't. Um, and he, he decides, though, that he's going to get into to music during this time, uh, which is a pretty good decision, given his talents. Yeah, and so at the time, this was 1957 when he came back from the Air Force, and he, you know, at the time, doo-wop was really popular. Doo-wop, doo-wop. That's right. And he was, again, very talented, unsurprisingly, so he decided that he was going to try to make it in the music industry. To start a group. Him and some guys that he knew started a group called the Marquis, and they were pretty popular in the D.C. area. One of their, their main struggles was that they had to contend with Marvin's gigantic ego. They were a quartet, and so... No one sings lead. No one is supposed to sing, sing lead, or, you know, they would have some songs where there was a lead or, like, a solo part, and in Marvin's mind, every solo part was his. <laughs> and, As me. Yeah, and it just and it didn't it didn't work out great. But they did get noticed by a uh, Mississippi blues singer who was a big deal at the time named Bo Diddley. And Bo Diddley was in large part, according to Ritz, who again one more thing that we just didn't mention was really instrumental in the general shift from traditional blues singing to like rock and roll. Like Bo Diddley was a big deal in the music industry, and and also Ritz when when he makes these kind of statements, he himself 
is from the music industry. Yeah. He actually worked on sexual healing with Marvin, which was, you know, one of his biggest Big songs hits, of all yeah. time. But so he, when he says that stuff, I'm just going to take his word for it because I'm not acquainted with the music industry pretty much at all. <laughs> pretty much at all? Just not at all. Okay. But anyway... Bo Diddley was a big deal for Marvin, not only because he admired his status and his talent and that sort of thing, but also Marvin viewed him as the like pinnacle of masculinity in music. Bo had like a big, deep voice and a, a full voice anyway. I'm not actually sure if he had a really deep voice, but he but had Bo- a very full voice. And, and one thing about Marvin that he always kind of critiqued himself from, and again, this goes back to his idea of, of masculinity and like what a man should look and sound like. Marvin had, uh, even though he could sing lower, he had a, a higher pitch, natural singing voice, and yeah. he describes his voice coming from his throat, where he felt that a full-bodied, quote-unquote, manly voice was one that came from deep in the stomach. From the diaphragm. Yeah, that's right. But Bo noticed some talent with the, the Marquis, and he decided that he was going to produce their first album. Yeah, and the album did not do It was well. a flop. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, this is still, was this more of a doo y kind of album? Yeah. Uh, and and, and I don't know. Is, if, this is coming to the end of doo wop Yeah, this is at the tail end of doo wop and I don't know if you guys have ever heard uh, Marvin Gaye, and if you haven't, you need to sit down. You need to, ta- you need to turn the podcast off and go and listen. Whoa, don't go that far. Just pause us. Pause us for a moment and uh, listen to a little bit of Marvin Gaye. But I, I just can't imagine Marvin singing doo And, you know, it just it just doesn't seem to fit. But, yeah, this this album comes out at the tail end of the kind of doo op phase in the United States. And it just doesn't really sell. And this, of course, for Marvin, who's, you know, his ego is the size of uh, something large, something large. Pick (laughs) just just pick something. It's damaging to his ego. Well, yeah, because when the album flopped. They had to go back to D.C. with, you know, more or less with their tails between their legs. And uh, guess who's there saying, you know what? Hey, didn't I say you were going to be a bum? You're still a bum. You're still a bum. And uh, to add insult to injury, Marvin, who we, we mentioned, is acutely aware of and familiar with racism in D.C., takes a pretty much the only job he could find was washing dishes at a whites only lunch counter. Rough. So it's like, you have to go to work every day dealing with that. And then that wasn't enough money for him to live on. So he's still sneaking back to his, his parents' house and avoiding and his father at all, avoiding cost. his father super hard, more or less with his hands out, asking his mom who's supporting their whole family for money. I'll tell you what, a mother's love. Irrational. Again, irrationality. <laughs> she should have cut him off. <laughs> Works out in the end. Does it? Whatever. You know, Are you familiar with the end of let's Marvin Gaye's <laughs> let, Let's keep it moving. All right. So after all this happens, he meets he meets a man who kind of serves as as bookends to Marvin's career. He was there when it, when it really took off, which we're about to talk about. And he was also there for the end of his career. His name's Harvey Fuqua. I'm Fuqua. That's what I'm going. That's with. how I. I mean, we're probably gonna sound like idiots at the end of this podcast. You but. know what though? I feel like so far everyone that we've recorded, I've ended up with the terrible name pronunciation so i'm i'm happy to let you cover some of these if you'd like to no 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 no. take it away with mr fuqua oh uh, yeah so anyway harvey fuqua was uh, a member of a, a pretty uh, successful group called the moon glows and great he, name yeah it is a good name and he side note i feel like a lot of really good musical names came from this general era my god absolutely we haven't we haven't even we go. We've come nowhere near the names that they had back then. But what about Migos? Let's. You know what? <laughs> I'm not even gonna say anything. So, anyway, Harvey, you know, decides that he's got to revamp this group that he has. The guys that he's with. There were some clashes over. I don't even know what. But he recruits Marvin and some of his buddies to join his new group, originally named Harvey and the Moon Glows. And Harvey was a big deal because. Not only was he another masculine figure for Marvin to look up to, he was also very talented, and he held these guys to an extremely high standard. And so the time that Marvin spent practicing and performing with Harvey, he really developed a lot musically. Okay, so now all of this is taking place in Chicago uh, in the late 1950s. Now, Harvey also had a giant ego. So Harvey and... uh, and gay often clashed, you know, but Harvey was smart enough to know, listen, I got some, I got something on my hands here. This guy has talent. I got a thoroughbred. Yeah. You, when you got a thoroughbred, you got to let him run, gotta you let know? Him run. So 
he realizes, look, we got to ditch these losers. Uh, <laughs> Nerds. I'm starting my own record label. And you know what? You're going to be one of my key artists. Yeah. And we're uh, going to Detroit. We're going to Detroit. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that is <laughs> Detroit. It's um, Melvin's hometown. Whatever. Look, let's, let's, okay. Go ahead. Continue. Uh, so, so <laughs> they, they go to Detroit. And, and if you know anything about the, the music history in the United States, you know, we're rolling into Motown. We are. Uh, so Harvey shows up and he, and he sets up his label. Uh, but what ends up happening is a uh, very kind of powerful music exec at the time by the name of... Well, he wasn't super powerful yet. And we're talking about Barry Gordy. Well, the, he would become... Yeah, he would become probably the, the music exec in the, in the United States for a long time. But he was still building up at this point. Right. And, uh, he and buys of course, out. he was building up Motown. Right. He buys out Harvey's... What's his last name, Melvin? Fuqua. All right, good. I just wanted you to have to screw something up. <laughs> he buys out the, uh, the label. So he's now acquired this thoroughbred, and he's prepared to let him run. But the thing that is, he's got the mind and the ideas to really help Marvin start to take off. Yeah, and, and a note on Gordy real quick. I just feel like we should give you a little background information. He was from a, a really ambitious and entrepreneurial family, and uh, it just seemed to like run in the in the blood all of his siblings were were super entrepreneurial and driven to to be successful and they really were successful barry started motown and uh his sisters are actually really involved with running initially their own labels and then they all kind of combined into the motown label and barry a lot of his wealth and success from the original Motown days came from the tried and true formula of not paying your artists very well and making them work like dogs. Yeah, basically, he would make sure that he had the rights to all of the, the songs. So He had the rights to pretty much everything. It was, it was kind of like, I, I'm sure this is not actually how it was run, but it, it reminded me of like having a bunch of W-2 employees who just created for you and wrote these smash hits and worked like 15 hour days and uh only you got rich so good formula for him so marvin knows where the money the power and the influence is so in his early days at motown he spends a lot of his time trying to cozy up to gordy and also uh smoky robinson who was at like the peak of his career at this the point. pinnacle right he's he is you know, the, the kind of shining face of, uh, of Motown at this time. And he actually is pretty successful kind of getting close to, to Smokey. Yeah, Smokey definitely kind of took him under his wing. Initially, Smokey needed a drummer. And Marvin couldn't read music or anything like that, but he, you know, he had a great ear. And so he's like, I can play the drums. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently, apparently he could well enough to tour with Smokey. And, and while they were touring together, they kind of got close. Can you imagine that? Like, yo, man. I just volunteered to, to drum for Smokey Robinson. I, I, I don't know how to play the drums. I, I've never played the drums. I need to figure this out <laughs> quick. <laughs> uh, but he, he played the drums for Smokey. And then also, you know, in order to get closer to Gordy, because, you know, initially Gordy wasn't particularly, uh, I mean, he's got all of these artists, you know, and he knew that he was going to have to wait his place in line. Um, and he thought that maybe I could jump the line by getting a little closer Marvin to. Marvin Gaye ain't waiting in no line. Right. He's like, I can't jump Smokey. But I can jump all these other, you know, <laughs> other <laughs> PG, people. PG, PG, Mar 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 <laughs> Melvin, keep it, keep it PG. Well, so what he ends up doing is going, you know, doing what any logical man would do. He says, Gordy has a sister. <laughs> Let me date. Gordy's. Do what any logical man would do. Working really hard. <laughs> no. Right. Let me date Gordy's sister, who happens to be 17 years his senior. Yeah. But that's and not a problem. No, you know, age is just a number, baby. Right, you know. But we mentioned that Marvin, handsome man, he's out here making all the ladies swoon. And she loved his music. She did. And, and I think that was another big attraction for Marvin. Well, more than one, but one was that how much she loved his music and how supportive she was. Marvin had a gigantic ego and it needed to be fed. And <laughs> she was really good at feeding it. And also, I kind of think... And Brits kind of touches on this that there was like a like a mother complex there that you know he was attracted to her in part because of how much older than him she was, and again she just always fed the ego. And according to to Marvin, there really was affection there. They really were mm. in love. But he also is very clear about the it fact a, that he knew he knew what he was doing. Uh, and I wonder if this is not to get ahead of ourselves, how things ended out maybe influenced how he thought about those times. Uh, yeah, I mean w when he was. 
working with Ritz to do this biography was close to the end of his life. Not that he, not that he necessarily a lot to reflect on. Yeah. Not that he necessarily thought it was going to be the end of his life. So it wasn't like, like that sort of thing, but he, he definitely was looking back on these memories. Uh, From hindsight. Yeah. This relationship that he develops with uh, Gordy's sister, Anna, or is it Annie and it's Anna, Anna, it really was helpful to, it, oh, for it, his career. It saved his bacon. Because because originally, you know, Marvin really wanted a uh, crossover hit. In his mind, the quickest way to be a huge sensation uh, in the United States at the time was to not only shoot up the quote-unquote black charts, but also the quote-unquote white charts. That's amazing that we had separate, like charts well i don't think that they i don't think they were like labeled black and white but it was but like gauging traditional like right? african-american music and you know i guess what what was considered like regular like pop was right. the quote-unquote like white charts but in order to be like a huge like smash sensa- smash sensation in the united states you had to cross over and uh he was sort of making music geared towards in crossing between. over and yeah. it just wasn't good music. It was a tweener. I mean, the people, you know, the the white community didn't necessarily enjoy it, and and the black community didn't necessarily enjoy it. Right. So he resigned himself to the the reality that he was going to have to push his way up the black charts and have that success there before he could actually create that crossover hit. Yeah. And while he was taking his time being not good, he was really lucky to have been in this relationship with Anna because I guess there was talk of him being dropped from the label at that point. And pretty much the only reason that he wasn't was because Anna was, was in her brother's ear. And let's, let's, let's take a moment to, to talk a little bit more about the relationship, which ultimately became extremely bizarre. Yeah, really. We, I mean, all of Marvin's relationships were extremely bizarre. Yeah. So he and Anna, you know, Marvin had these kind of weird I don't want to call them weird because, you know, people have fetishes. No, man, we can call them weird. All right. He had this, <laughs> he had this, uh, this fetish about other men sleeping with his significant other. He was a cuckold. Yeah. And I mean, that's what we be. call it today, right? This was, this was pre-cuckold days. Was it? They didn't have a name for that. Like, they might have. All right. Well, they might have. I don't know. We'll have to do a little bit of historical research on the... Well, the come on, man. You're the historian here. You're supposed to know these things. Well, you've got a master's degree that in history. That doesn't count. Well, that absolutely counts. But, you know, what, what Marvin would do is he would, he would kind of press Anna to enter these relationships. Well, not yet. Not yet? I think you're getting ahead of yourself. He, man, we're going to get there. But He would just discover these things, well, right? Because the relationship... I believe the way I understood it from, from reading Ritz was that he was just really, he had this fantasy of being cuckolded, of someone else making love to his wife or significant other or whatever. And in his mind, which is really ironic because of how much of like a sex symbol he goes on to become, yeah. he could never measure up to another man. In his mind, it was always a more masculine, An- more uh, Yeah, you know, and only they could man. please his his woman. And, and so he, at one point with Anna, finds her cheating on him with another man. And he discovers that he really liked it. This is And this exposes the depths of kind of how sort of uh, tortured the relationship had become because he's he's already, you know, he's not being faithful. And then she's also not. And in, the, in a strange way, he realizes that this turns him on and it just kind of further, for, you know, it further strains the relationship. Uh, and, and Anna has, um, you know, she responded to these things in really different ways. Yeah, you know, she wasn't perfect either. Uh, right. You know, we've I feel like we've talked a lot about how... Marvin had these flaws, which makes sense because this is an episode about Marvin. But she certainly didn't help uh, the situation either in terms of their relationship. She was an extremely jealous woman. Kind of, I guess, sort of understandably, you know, at this point, Marvin is around spending a ton of time with all these really good looking, talented young women at Motown. And, you know, right around, you know, early on in their relationship, Marvin really saw himself as like a a chivalrous, monogamous man who would never cheat on his wife. And I mean, he absolutely goes on to cheat on his wife a lot. But at the time, he wasn't. But that didn't stop these ladies at uh, Motown who were significantly younger than Anna and she felt a lot better looking and that sort of thing from flirting with with Marvin and you know Ritz quotes some of the the people he knew from from back then about you know they they really did they all had crushes on on Marvin and and uh they just absolutely loved him a lot of it had to do with the fact that when Marvin sang 
these songs, he would get really, really into it. I mean, it's so totally obvious whenever you listen to him. Like he's yeah. picturing whoever he's singing about in his mind, and and that just got right to these. Ladies. And sometimes it's, it's also important to note, like duets are peaking. No one listens to duets nowadays, but this is like you know where how how artists nowadays have that feature, yeah, that really sets it off. Think Bruno Mars and Cardi B, Ed Sheeran and Beyonce. Yes. And, you know, he's doing these, these duets with all of these women and, and seeing Marvin, you know, singing with these women and really just like gushing over them and getting into it, just, it, it tore Anna apart and yep. it really added a lot of stress onto their relationship, which, you know, there's a lot of levels to it, right? Okay. So I want to back us up for just a second, because I feel like we're about to get ahead of ourselves. Quick side note. We talked about how Marvin had been looking for a big crossover hit, and he finally got it in 1963 with his uh, single Pride and Joy, which he wrote about Anna. In 1964 is when he started doing those duets that Melvin was talking about. And again, hugely popular, but really didn't help the marriage, which was already already strained. Yeah, I mean, Marvin was the type when, when he performed and when he wrote, he wasn't just going through the motions, you know, there, there had to be something behind it. Uh, so in a lot of these duets, you know, Anna's seeing him pour his heart out uh, yeah. to these to these women, and it just tore her up. So their 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 relationship was further strained. And what is the best possible way to improve a relationship? Got to have a kid. Yeah, definitely the best the best answer for an already tenuous rocky relationship is to get a child involved. And this is what I always say. You know, it's like baby. You know, like we're on the rocks right now. We just need a little bundle of joy. We just need another human to care for. <laughs> that will make everything better. I hope you can all tell that we're being sarcastic. So they adopt a baby. And they Marvin the third. Marvin the third. That's right. And, 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 you know, it really does. It brings them closer together for a little bit. Short period of time. Yeah. And, you know, it's really sad, actually, with, with Marvin because Marvin Jr., so Marvin Gaye, the, the subject of this episode, he really just loved this kid, like, he gave this kid the love that he never got and always wanted from his father, but unable to escape his father's influence, he was very jealous and yeah. hated himself for it. He recognized it in himself, or at least he, he does, you know, years later when he's recounting these, these memories to the biographer, that he, as much as he loved his son, he was jealous of him for the affection that he got from Anna and even from like the tabloids and that sort of stuff. Yeah. There was one incident where he was performing and someone passed him his infant son and the crowd goes like nuts. Just over the kid. Just cause an adorable baby. And Marvin was like really uncomfortable with it. And he, you know, he made sure they got him off the stage as quickly as possible because he had just been upstaged. And, uh, he felt like it somehow interrupted the, the audience's ability to appreciate his artistic performance. This is exactly the same situation as his father feeling upstaged by him yeah. when he was preaching. And this is really bizarre considering it's an infant. Yeah, you know? we're talking about a baby. Yeah, we're talking about an infant son, and you're just like, you know what? I don't like that you're, you know, listening, looking at this baby and not listening to this beautiful music that I'm making. Look at me and look at how great I am. Ignore this baby. Somebody take this child. So, yeah, just wanted to interject that important life moment that Marvin had a child. But so, as we mentioned, you know, he started doing those duets in, in 64. Um, by the late 60s, things were starting to go a little sideways for Marvin. The marriage was... You know, not that it had ever not been rocky. It was definitely like really rocky. Marvin had gone about cheating as often as he pleased. He had also picked up a cocaine habit. That, this is before Medellin. <laughs> yeah, it was. But he was uh, he got his hands on it, and he continued these duets, which were hugely popular. But again, didn't didn't help the marriage. And this is kind of when we we see him develop a relationship with his favorite duet partner, Tammy Terrell, and and their relationship, by all accounts, was was nothing more than a friendship, but. They were very close, and so Anna was really jealous by this, and Tammy's kind of a tragic figure in this whole thing. Do you want to talk about her? Yeah, uh, Tammy, you know, great performer, great artist, but one day on stage while uh, she's performing with Marvin, she collapses into his arms, which I'm sure probably seemed like... Like an act. Yeah, um, but it was actually some sort of, uh, you know, a serious problem, and it's unclear what actually what actually was afflicting this woman, but she she didn't die that day. She actually died three years later, but she was never the same. I guess general consensus, even though it wasn't necessarily 100% proven ever, was that she had been in a relationship with a 
a abusive, really yeah. a really abusive man who had beat her a lot and you know there was speculation that this was a consequence of, of some sort of viol- the you know. violence and that sort of thing and and Marvin really really took this to heart to him he he kind of stopped believing in the the purity of love yeah, um, at this yeah. point he he really viewed Tammy as a victim of a love. victim of love yeah. and uh, and so this really kind of tainted the way he he uh, looked at things and for someone who really kind of cut his teeth making you know love songs uh, he he just stopped performing. You know, he shut down for a little while, and he definitely wasn't going to do any more duets. duets. And yeah. and actually, they had been working on an album together. And after she collapsed, she was no longer able to to do any sort of recording, performing anything like that. But they were still working on this album together. And Barry Gordy really pushed Marvin to finish it with someone else who was imitating her voice. And Marvin really didn't like that idea, but. Uh, Gordy kind of sat him down and was like, listen, we need to do this for Tammy. So, you know, she's going to have medical expenses. Like, she's going to need this money. And uh, because of that, he did finish the album. And, and that's exactly what that money was used for, was to kind of take care of her and her eventual, like, funeral expenses and her medical costs and that sort of stuff. So it's also important to kind of to, to set up the backdrop um, in which all of this is taking place. Uh, so this is, I mean, this is the 60s, man. This is the, uh, you know, a turbulent decade in the United States where um, there's political issues. You know, you have the Vietnam War, but also kind of uh, the civil rights movement and, and racial issues are, are coming to the fore. And Marvin was not one to just kind of, you know, he didn't just focus on the music. He also was very kind of uh, politically engaged, not maybe necessarily in the form of like going out and, and doing activism. He wasn't leading no marches. <laughs> right, but he was he was he was engaged, you know, and and this yeah. is this, this stems back to kind of uh, his experiences in D.C. and and living in in you know in segregated cities. So you know the late '60s, you know, you have the death of King, you have the long hot summers, um, the Holy Week uprising, and you know he has a little bit of uh, you know political strife. And one thing that we haven't mentioned is that you know all of this time he's finally starting to make a little bit of money, and you know. He's not paying anyone, and that includes Uncle Sam. And to make matters worse, Marvin's upset because he's become, woe is me, a sex symbol. He's out here making art. Right? So he's, he's upset because he's not, he, he feels that his music isn't being appreciated for its artistic value, and he's just being seen as a sexual object. I'm not just sexy. I'm a genius. Literally, a musical genius. Yeah. Uh, so this is really frustrating to him and, and when you really put it in the the kind of picture of what his life is looking like at this moment he's got a strained marriage that has now they've injected a child into this uh which political... uh, you know shockingly didn't make didn't everything help. better yeah and all of this culminates into a, a suicide attempt in which he he grabs a loaded gun uh decides that he's gonna sit in the room so uh, he like holes up in their apartment or whatever. Yeah, and he basically says he's gonna kill himself and anyone who tries to come in um, and stop him. And everyone heeds his words, with the exception of one person. Yeah, and we haven't mentioned him yet, but Anna's father, who they just call Pops Gordy, he was kind of like the the Gordy patriarch, was a another father figure that Marvin really respected a lot. And and he says in the book that Pops was the only one who could have saved him from killing himself. And that's exactly what he does. And this guy had some stones. Oh, yeah. Marvin had had holed up and he and he said, you know, anyone walks that door is getting shot. And Pops just walks through the door and he's like, what are you doing? Yeah. You're acting like an idiot. Give me the gun. And, and he uh, gave him the gun. Yeah. And he gave him the gun. So uh, props to Pops. Props to Pops. And so it's hard to understate the the state of depression that that Marvin had kind of found himself in um, at this point. He's really and he's kind of prone to this, as we'll see. And, you know, today we treat depression a lot differently than it was treated then. It was kind of yeah. like, buck up. You know what I mean? Like pull yourself up. Yeah. And and he certainly wasn't about to go and pursue any any help at, at the time. You know, he we already talked about this vision of masculinity that he had for himself and that sort of stuff. And so he definitely would have thought that, you know, seeking help was, was not a manly thing to do. You just strong, silent type it until you're, until you're through it. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think that, you know, there's that stigma around, you know. Mental health. On, yeah, mental health back then that really there was, there was a lot kind of, a lot of reasons why he avoided it. But man, if he had been alive today, hand out Zanny's like Starburst oh, on Halloween. But at the uh, time, he needed an outlet and sports became that outlet for him. And, <laughs> and it got to the point where really the only time he was doing anything other than 
you know, laying around in his house, laying around and doing coke was when he would train, train, and you know he had he had made friends because by this point he's a, he's a well known artist and he's kind of a big deal and he had friends who played for the Lions, he had friends who were just people who liked to play pickup basketball and that sort of stuff, and it seemed like that was the only the only thing that would get him out of bed. So he became a fairly good athlete, and I think like all of us, he decides one day, man, I'm I'm going ahead and try out for the. Uh, for the Detroit Lions. Yeah, we've all been there. And I'm going to just play professional football. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, that doesn't really work out. But, again, he had he had friends who played for the Lions, and, and they recognized that him training to try to play for the Lions was the only thing that was getting him out of bed. It was basically and, keeping him alive during this period of time. Exactly, and so they didn't want to, like, crush his dreams. So they kind of, like, propped him up. And, and by all accounts, he became a pretty good athlete. He probably underestimated, like I feel like a lot of people do, these Monday morning quarterbacks, what it actually takes to to play at that level. Well, I mean, I think right now I'm good for 14 on any given Sunday. Hmm. <laughs> all right. Uh, Eric <laughs> seems to Moving disagree. right along. Uh, so he, you know, during this time, he takes, you know, like a two-year. A two-year break from performing. Yeah. And, and I mean, he already hated to tour. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's another thing that's like a, another contradiction about Marvin is that he really hated to perform. He would get intense anxiety before he went on in any show, like yeah. almost regardless of the size of the venue. And, and he says that it really took him a few songs to like shake that feeling of despair and, and yeah. extreme discomfort. And he would always say, like, afterwards, he was just drained. Yeah. Uh, just emotionally, physically just drained. Um, so, and, I mean... And in desperate need of some more Coke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fueled him. Uh, but, I mean, just to... to I'm sorry, this, but, like, what? think about, like, the Gatorade commercials. Oh, my just God. instead... A little bit like, of Coke instead it's of just electrolytes. Coke, like, how they have all the pregame and then, like, the postgame recovery. And oh, my Marvin's God. just over here doing lines of postgame recovery Coke. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right, so when Marvin finally does decide to come back and make music, he's not coming back in the same vein. We're getting a different, a different Marvin Gaye. Yeah, well, he, you know, we talked about that he was very tuned into politics at the time, and mm-hmm. while he's on this self-imposed ban from performing, he's thinking a lot about politics and the what's ideas going are on percolating. and Vietnam, which is his younger brother was serving in over in Vietnam. So he starts writing a political album. Don't forget either that he's still signed to Motown. And so all this going on, they're banging on his door, looking like, what are you doing? Hey, man, you got an album? They're expecting another love album, but he's working on this political album, and they're, he's getting a lot of pushback from it. Yeah, because, I mean, at that time, I mean, there wasn't a lot of the, these sorts of, you know, political, you know, spill your heart out type uh, albums out there. I mean, it was, I mean, look, he was supposed to do what he did and did well. If the formula, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. But he... But, you know, in this instance, it kind of actually worked out. Yeah, you know, I feel like being a musical genius will uh, cover up a lot of... Yeah, it helps. Yeah, <laughs> it, it helps a lot. But So he writes what's considered one of his best albums. It's called What's Going On, and it contains my favorite Marvin Gaye song, which is uh, Mercy Me. And Also, What's Going On. Yeah, and also What's Going On. But he, he writes this album, and he receives a tremendous amount of pushback from Motown, and they're like, we're not releasing this. No one's going to like it. And he kind of just puts his foot down. He's like, listen... Trump card. Yeah, he's like, listen, if you're not going to release this album, you're not going to release any Marvin Gaye album ever again. Yeah, so. he basically said, if you don't release this album, I'm never recording for you again, period. Yeah. And, and it's interesting, the way that Marvin liked to record and write is, and we mentioned this when we were talking about the duets, is he really got into the music and really, like when he was singing his duets, he was always singing to Anna, even though like their relationship was messed up, he still loved her. And so he was always singing in his mind to her. He didn't serve in Vietnam, and that's really what what the album centered around. So he actually kind of wrote this album from the perspective of his younger brother, Frankie, who, you know, he wasn't brother of the year to. Right, yeah. Uh, Frankie always, like, looked up to to Marvin, especially as Marvin became extremely popular and stuff. And Frankie, for instance, would write to Marvin, and, like, no one believed that in the, in the Army when he was in Vietnam, no one believed that he was uh, Marvin Gaye's little brother, partially because Marvin had, by this time, added the E to, to his last name, and, and yeah. Frankie had not. And, you know, Marvin would get these letters and just never write him back. And Which is why It's hard to imagine. Like, if, if, if my cold. brother's serving, like, I'm like, man, I'm writing you letters every day because, you know, anything could happen. But not Marvin. And, and also later, when, when Frankie comes back, and Frankie, who looks strikingly similar to Marvin... He's a, he's a solid musician in yeah, his own Yeah, he right. was very talented, and Marvin felt really threatened by that. He, he viewed Frankie as the, the more masculine version of himself, and so he, when Frankie came back, 
Marvin really went to lengths to kind of like make sure he never took off. Yeah, which he right. wanted to do. He wanted to be a, a musician like uh like Marvin, but you know, uh Marvin was like, Listen, man, you, you can sing back up. But stay in your lane, stay bro. In your lane. Don't don't try to come out here and be the lead, uh, because I can't have that. Yeah. I'm not gonna let you or my son take my shine. And and doubling back to uh to what's going on, this album being the the musical masterpiece that it was, it finally gave Marvin that respectability that, that he had validation. been looking for. He was now more than just a sex symbol. He was a pure, a true artiste. And that is actually a pretty good place to pause for Marvin Gaye Part 1. This is right at, what, 1971 was when What's yeah, Going On was released? Yeah, we've covered his life up until 1971, so we're in the early 70s, and things are only going to get more Weirder. wild. <laughs> yeah, so we'll pick up there for uh, Part 2. Thanks for listening. Hey, before we take off, I just want to remind you guys how you can support the show. First, you can rate, review, and tell a friend, and also follow us on social media. Especially Twitter. We're at the Life of X podcast. Additionally, you can head over to lifeofxpodcast.com slash support, where you will find portals to audible.com, amazon.com, and patreon.com. For those of you who are unfamiliar, Audible is a gigantic and wonderful audiobook website. You can receive a free audiobook when you sign up through our website. You go through our Amazon portal. Any purchases that you make, Amazon kicks us a small percentage of that. And finally, you can head over to our Patreon page where you can sign up to make a contribution to the show on a per-episode basis. We appreciate your support. Thank you.